There was a beautiful girl named Brandy. You would think she was the most popular girl in town because of her beauty. However, she was quiet and introverted student who always kept to herself. She never really spoke to anyone and had no friends. From the looks of it, she looked like a well-mannered girl that was trying to do the right thing. But Brandy had a secret, a secret that nobody knew about. She was just waiting for the right person to come along. She would have an obsessive personality about males sometimes and didn't know what to think of it. She was considered a yandere. For those who don't know, a yandere is a character who is sweet and innocent on the outside, but on the inside, they are completely obsessed with someone to the point where they might become dangerously possessive or violent. Brandy's obsession was with a boy named Michael. Michael was a popular guy in school. He was outgoing, friendly, and always had a smile on his face. He was the complete opposite of Brandy, but she couldn't help but fall in love with him. She would often watch him from a distance, admiring his every move. She loved the way he laughed, the way he talked, the way he walked. She loved everything about him, but had not even said a word to him. He had no idea who she was. They had never talked at all or interacted. They had never even bumped into each other on accident. Why was Brandy so obsessed with Michael? Brandy's love for Michael soon turned into an obsession. She started stalking him, following him everywhere he went. He would never see her. She was always there. She would often hide behind corners, watching him as he walked by. She would take pictures of him on her phone without his knowledge, and even would collect his discarded items, like used tissues or his hair. She created a Pinterest, YouTube channel, TikTok, and Twitter that was dedicated to Michael and her love for him. She did not have many followers that she knew, but mostly complete strangers. She would talk about what Michael was doing in the videos and pretended she was his girlfriend. Most viewers thought she was actually his girlfriend and gave comments that were supportive of their fake relationship. The disturbing thing is that viewers of the stalking content did not report the content but liked and followed it immensely. Finally, one day, Michael saw Brandy in the corner of his eye. He saw her on her phone behind a corner taking a video of him. He went directly up to her and asked her what she was doing. She was so shocked and scared, she did not know what to say. He asked if she was recording him. She said nothing. He was creeped out by her behavior and asked her to stop. Brandy was heartbroken. She couldn't believe that Michael would reject her. She thought that they were meant to be together, forever. She had dedicated her life to him and had so many hopes and dreams with him that would never happen now. From that day on, Brandy's obsession with Michael became more intense. She would leave love letters on his locker, write his name in her notebooks, and even made a shrine dedicated to him in her room. She would often take to a doll that she made in his likeness, pretending that he was there with her. Michael began to notice that Brandy's behavior was becoming more and more bizarre. He became afraid of her and started to avoid her at all costs. But Brandy couldn't take the rejection. She was determined to have Michael all to herself, even if it meant hurting him or hurting anyone who got in her way. One late night, Michael came home to his house. His parents were not home, on a date or something. He took off his jacket and walked towards the closet to hang it up. As he opened the door, Brandy lunged a kitchen knife right into his left chest. He pulled it out and started fighting for his life. Michael fought back, trying to defend himself from Brandy's vicious knife swings. But Brandy was too strong. She was too fueled by her love for Michael and was determined to make him pay, no matter what the cost. The struggle continued as it was noticed by some people walking their dog outside. They could see the attack through the window, but thought Michael was attacking Brandy. They called the police immediately. The police arrived and they found Michael lying on the floor, covered in blood, and Brandy standing over him with a knife in her hand. Brandy was arrested and charged with attempted murder. She was sent to a mental rehabilitation clinic on Shutter Island, where she still resides to this day. Her obsession with Michael never faded, even after all these years. She has thousands of drawings of Michael on her walls in her room. She still talks to the doll she made in his likeness, and she still has dreams of the day when they can be together, forever. Watch your back and know your surroundings. You may have an interested person watching your every move.
There was a girl named Olivia who was deeply in love with a boy named Noah. She was so in love that it consumed her every thought and action. She would follow him everywhere, taking pictures of him when he wasn't looking, and sneaking into his room to watch him sleep. Noah was unaware of Olivia's obsessive behavior and thought she was just a friendly classmate. However, her obsession grew stronger every day, and she started to see anyone who got close to Noah as a threat. She would lash out at other girls who spoke to him, and would become violent towards any female she thought was getting too close to him. One day, Noah had a new girlfriend named Ayumi. Olivia was livid and felt betrayed. She could not let this be allowed. Noah was hers. She decided to do something about it. She started stalking Ayumi, following her around during her daily activities. Olivia found out where Ayumi lived and devised a plan to take her out. One night, Olivia snuck into Ayumi's house and watched her sleep for a while. While she was standing there watching Ayumi sleep peacefully, she thought, how can Noah like this girl? She isn't even pretty. I'm pretty, not her. I hate her. She doesn't deserve to live. Olivia grabbed a pillow and put it on Ayumi's face. She held it as hard as she could. Olivia was awakened by her sudden lack of oxygen and struggled to escape the situation. Olivia was too powerful and Ayumi did not stand a chance. Ayumi died by Olivia's hands and would never see Noah again. Noah was devastated by the loss of Ayumi and didn't know what to do. Olivia saw this as an opportunity to comfort him and show him that she was the only one that truly loved him. She approached Noah and expressed her condolences for his loss. He was happy about her concern and gave his thanks to her. She was so excited. He really liked her. They became closer over time, and Noah had no idea that Olivia was the one that murdered his girlfriend. They started hanging out often. At first, Noah was really happy to spend time with Olivia. She was so kind to him and helped him with whatever was troubling him. She was very beautiful as well, and he was very attracted to her. However, he had not made any moves yet because he was still grieving over the loss of his girlfriend. This irritated Olivia, who was growing impatient. Olivia's obsession grew even stronger. She would call Noah all the time. At first, he was happy to talk to her. Over time, though, he realized that there was something going on with Olivia. She would call almost constantly. If he did not answer, she would send him a lot of text messages. Noah liked the attention he was getting from Olivia, but this was going overboard. When he asked her to stop sending so many messages, she would just respond, I was concerned about you and wanted to make sure you were okay. It is hard to make someone that cares about you stop trying to help you. But where's the line? How many missed calls and text messages is too much? The number of text messages that were expressing concerns was pushing to 50 each time Noah did not answer for a while. This happened when he was in class, at the gym, or sleeping. Noah was getting tired of giving Olivia a break. After a while, she started to become more and more violent. She would lash out at anyone who she thought was getting in the way of her and Noah. She even started to hurt Noah himself. At that time, he started to see some major problems with Olivia. He decided to confront her and break the whole thing off. He appreciated her concern and was happy she helped him through a rough time in his life but he had to move on. They were not going to be together or even friends anymore. Olivia did not take the news well. When she went home, her cat came to her for a daily dose of affection. Olivia pet her cat with love and affection. Suddenly, she squeezed her cat until it struggled to breathe. She had killed her cat, her best friend because of a boy. One day, Olivia's obsession reached a breaking point. Noah found a new girlfriend and Olivia couldn't handle it. She followed them on a date to a restaurant. They got a table outside and ordered a fancy meal they would enjoy together. Noah really liked the new girl and was determined to make a good impression. They had such a great time throughout the course meal and were holding hands lovingly. The dessert came out and they were feeding each other with some sensual stares and strong affection. Olivia appeared suddenly in the outside dining area and took out a butcher knife. She attacked the girl, leaving her badly injured. After stabbing the girl multiple times, she ran away. It was so quick that Noah had no time to react to stop it from happening. 
Noah saw what Olivia had done and was terrified. He used a towel to create a tourniquet and was able to stop the bleeding on his date. He called the police. Olivia was arrested for the attack and sent to the county jail. Noah tried to move on with his life, but he couldn't shake the feeling that Olivia was still watching him. He would look over his shoulder constantly and was always on edge. As the years went by, the terrible events slightly faded and Noah was able to relax a little bit. Olivia was detained and he did not have to live in fear forever. He was tired of looking at every person and any place that he went, looking for Olivia to appear with a butcher knife to finish him off. One night, Noah was walking home from a late shift at work when he saw Olivia waiting for him outside of his apartment building. He tried to run, but she caught up to him and tackled him to the ground. She whispered in his ear, they were meant to be together forever, and pulled out a knife. Noah struggled against Olivia, but he couldn't break free. She plunged a knife into his heart, killing him instantly. Olivia smiled as she watched Noah take his last breath, believing that they were finally together forever. The police found Noah's body the next morning and began to investigate the case. They discovered that Olivia had escaped from the local penitentiary and had been on the run for weeks. They launched a manhunt for her, but she was never found. Just remember, once you have a stalker, you always have a stalker. If they're being detained, it's only a matter of time before they come and find you. It was just another day at school for Mark, a high school senior, who spent most of his time playing video games and hanging out with his friends. He was a popular kid, but he never cared about being famous or being in the spotlight. All he wanted was to pass his final exams and get into a good college. Little did he know that his life was about to take a drastic turn, thanks to a girl in his class named Catherine. Catherine was a quiet and reserved girl who never spoke to anyone in class except for Mark. She had been secretly in love with him for years, but Mark had never noticed throughout their long friendship. Catherine had never indicated to Mark that she was in love with him, and behaved as a friend would. Mark was under the impression that their friendship was really strong. He could always reach out to her for advice. She would always come over and hang out and talk to Mark if he asked her to do so. She really was the best friend Mark ever had. One day, Mark came to school and found a note on his locker. A note was from Catherine. It said, meet me after school at the park. Mark didn't know what to make of it, but he decided to go anyways, thinking that Catherine just wanted to do something fun. When Mark arrived at the park, he found Catherine waiting for him. She looked nervous and fidgety, and she was carrying a large backpack. Mark asked her what was in the backpack, but Catherine just smiled and said, don't worry about it. I just want to spend some time alone with you. Mark and Catherine spent the afternoon together talking about their favorite books, movies, and video games. Just as the sun began to set, Catherine's behavior started to become more and more strange. She kept staring at Mark with an intense look in her eyes, and she wouldn't let him leave the park. When Mark tried to get up and go home, Catherine grabbed him by the arm and said, Please don't go, Mark. I love you so much. I can't live without you. Mark started to feel scared, and he tried to break free from Catherine's grasp. But Catherine was surprisingly strong, and she wouldn't let go. She started to cry, and Mark felt bad for her. He didn't want to hurt her feelings, but he knew he had to get away. As he turned to leave, he heard a loud thud behind him. When he looked back, he saw Catherine lying on the ground, her backpack open beside her. Mark walked over to her and saw that she had a large kitchen knife in her hand. She had stabbed herself in the stomach, and blood was pouring out of her wound. Mark called 911, and Catherine was rushed to the hospital. She survived, but she was never the same again. She became more obsessed with Mark than ever before, and she started to stalk him wherever he went. She would show up to his house uninvited, send him hundreds of text messages, and even leave love letters in his locker. Mark didn't know what to do. He was scared for his life, and he didn't know how to make Catherine stop. He tried talking to her telling her that he didn't feel the same way, but she wouldn't listen. She was convinced that Mark was the only one for her, and she would stop at nothing to make him hers. One day, Mark came home from school and found Catherine waiting for him in his room. She had broken into his house 
and she was sitting on his bed, wearing a white wedding dress. Mark was terrified that he decided to hear what she had to say. Catherine told Mark that she was feeling extremely obsessed with him and couldn't stop thinking about him. She apologized to him for stabbing herself. She asked him if he could ever forgive her. Seeing that she was going through a terrible situation where she was determined to be self-destructive, Mark lost his sense of fear and grabbed her hand. He looked into her eyes and said, We will get through this together. She cried uncontrollably. Mark took a chance on Catherine his best friend for a long time. She was always good to him. She deserved a chance in life. Thirteen years later, we are still married. We have two children, one boy, one girl. Catherine had some personal trauma earlier in her life that caused her to act out in some scary ways. She had never told me about it and I never knew. I didn't know she would be the best and most genuine person that I would ever have met. It turns out that she was not a young ditty but she just needed a partner to help her get better. I've been that partner for her. Sometimes Catherine can revert to some of her stalkerish, obsessive ways. I am her medicine, though. Once I comfort her, she instantly feels better and her obsessions fade. I am okay with having someone obsess over me. Being with her is the best decision I ever made. Sometimes stalkers can seem terrifying, there's somebody out there for everyone. It could be a stalker, it could be a normal relationship. But I have a feeling that Catherine will never leave Mark. Why do they want to ruin your life? I was working at a diner in a small town when I met a girl named Scarlett. When she first got the job as a server, I was blown away of how beautiful she was. Why would anyone want to work in a dump like this? I guess the story was that Scarlett did not come from a great home. Her father left when she was five years old, and her mother slept around constantly, bringing strange men to the home. Scarlett would wake up and see strange men watching TV at her house, making their own food, and leaving clothes everywhere. Sometimes it got scary, as some of the men would stare at her in a scary way. She would tell her mother, but nothing was ever done. Scarlett got out of her mother's house as soon as she could and the money she made from the diner would help pay for her apartment. I thought the story was so tough, and it made me like her even more. She was so kind, offering to help out anyone with their jobs. She cooked, cleaned, and served the customers. It was truly an amazing sight to see. As we had more shifts together, I was starting to secretly fall in love with her. She was perfect to me in every way, and I was feeling like I wanted to help her achieve her best. Not that she needed my help. I think she liked me too. But then again, she was just so kind to everyone. After a few months of working together, I heard her talking about her struggle to make the rent. She was doing everything right, not going out and just working extra shifts to get ahead. But with the inflated grocery and gas price, she was having a hard time. I pitched the idea of us moving in together, and she smiled. I moved out of my parents' house and in with Scarlett. She had a two-bedroom, so I had my own room. I did love the smell of hers, though. It smelled like lavender and peach. I was all moved in, but tried to keep my distance. I respected her and wanted to make sure she felt comfortable with me there. We continued to work our shifts at work, but we were now on the same shift and carpooling. We put our money together and were able to easily pay the bills with money left over. Everything was great. If this is what it's like to move out of your parents' house and have freedom, it was great. It was only possible, though, with a solid roommate. One night, on one of our off days, we were watching Netflix and having some drinks. Scarlett had always been pretty reserved, but she suddenly looked at me for longer than normal while we were sitting up on the couch. She started rubbing my leg. I'm a guy, so the wind gets me excited. She leaned over to kiss me. In the back of my mind, I did not want to ruin a good thing with my friend. But on the other hand, I was in love with her and had not let her in on my secret. She took me to the bed and we did the deed. When we were done, we looked at each other while lying in bed. We promised that we wouldn't make it weird after that. 
However, that's when things took a turn for the worse. So one night, we were doing the night shift, and I had a table of drunk girls that just got back from going out. They were all very attractive, but I tried to keep it professional. I did make conversation, but tried to keep it related to food and drinks. Somehow, though, I found myself in a long conversation with one of the beautiful women asking me about myself. The feeling of flattery made me turn a light shade of red, and that's when I saw Scarlet in the corner of my eye. She looked irritated. I took her to the side of the stock room and told her I was just trying to do my job. No matter what I said, though, she looked pissed. I went back out and tried to get through the shift without doing something else. On the ride home, I apologized again, but got no response. To be honest, I didn't really think I did anything wrong, but felt the need to reassure her that I was okay to trust, given her background. We got home, and it was silent. Not knowing what to do, I just went to bed. I was woken up in the middle of the night and smelled the scent of lavender and peach. Scarlet had crawled into bed with me and was cuddling. She started kissing me and we had sex again. When I woke up, I thought everything was okay again. We were having breakfast and there was a knock at the door. It was an attractive girl looking for another girl named Beth. Probably someone else that used to live here. Scarlet suddenly got really angry and yelled at the girl that Beth doesn't live here. She slammed the door in the girl's face and then looked right at me. Who was that? Surprised, I said, I don't know. She said, don't lie to me. I told her, I swear, I have no idea. She said she was looking for some girl named Beth. Scarlet was accusing me of knowing that girl like she had come to see me. This was just not possible. Scarlet and I were always together. We always had the same shifts, went shopping together, and spent time together on our off time. Scarlet was making it up, but I didn't want to tell her that. She was the most jealous person I have ever met, and it was all in her head. I was starting to get pretty scared. The last straw for me was when my sister came to see me one night during a shift. Sadly, my sister is attractive too, but not to me, obviously. That's what I heard from other people. To Scarlett, though, she might as well have been Scarlett Johansson. As my sister and I were talking, Scarlett went into freak out 1000% mode. She started yelling at me and my sister in front of the entire store, accusing me of cheating on her with a slut. I tried to explain that it was my sister but it was no use. She started throwing chairs out of the way to get to my sister, and I stood right in her way. I told her, it's over, and I was moving out. She suddenly stopped her rampage and collapsed on the floor. She was crying uncontrollably. I left the diner with my sister and went straight to my apartment. My sister and I packed up the stuff and got out of there before Scarlett could get back. I moved back in with my parents and quit my job. My sister and I explained what happened to my parents, and they were happy that we were okay. I'm not sure what happened to Scarlett, but I didn't look back. I had enough and didn't want to see her again. If you have a partner that doesn't treat you well, most of the time it isn't you. It's them. I don't like boss babes. I was working at a firm in the city with a co-worker named Trish. Trish was such a beautiful and sweet woman. A true team player, always looking out for everyone. That is, until she got a promotion and became a completely different person. Trish had always been pretty modest and professional. She dressed very business conservative and was always focused on the job. She always took time to ask me about my weekend and make other small talk. Her hard work over the years had paid off and she was promoted to a leading position in the company, and now was my direct supervisor. I was thrilled and thought she was a great choice and excited to work for her. We had worked together well for years. We helped each other accomplish the various tasks the boss would throw at us. It was never a problem because we had great professional chemistry together and were very efficient. She did get the promotion though and not me, but that was okay. My time would come and I didn't mind. 
She was a good person and the best choice for the company. As time went on though, her demeanor towards me changed. She was like a toxic male, but in female form. She would grab my muscles and tell me how strong I looked. I did like that because I made it a priority to stay in good shape, but it was different hearing it from her. She would caress my butt and tell me my slacks fit well. I kind of like that too, but it is weird. She was completely different for some reason and was really into me for some reason. She suddenly started wearing her business suit top and her buttons unbuttoned, showing her cleavage. I'm not going to lie, it was pretty nice to see. I had no idea that was under there this whole time. I was starting to feel a way about her, but I had to keep it professional. I always liked women that were in charge. I liked the fact that they knew what they wanted and had it all figured out, but I learned that I didn't like it when I was starting to get bossed around. I was late one day, and Trish called me into her office. She closed the door behind me and closed the blinds. She scolded me for being late, and I agreed not to do it again. She was touching herself in the breast area, and I did notice. It's kind of weird. I was just trying not to drool, and kept staring forward. She apologized for the tough talk, and told me she needed me to work late to make up for it. I agreed, and went back to work. That day, everyone left at four as usual, but I stayed behind. I was in detention, and Trish was my teacher. Once everyone was gone, I asked her what she needed me to do, and she said, Me. She took her clothes off, and I was unsure what to do. She told me that my life would be good here if I satisfied her. So I did. It was my pleasure. After that, I would work late very often. We would wait for everyone to leave. She would disrobe, and so would I. I was having a good time. Sure, it was unethical as hell, but it was fun all the same. It was when another co-worker named Samantha started taking interest in me that we had a problem. Sam was much younger than Trish, and it really pissed Trish off. She had a much tighter body, and wore more provocative clothing. Although still within company regulations, Samantha would stop by my desk daily and chat me up. It was fun, but would be shut down by the boss lady, Trish. At our daily office meetings, Trish tried to discourage fraternization, as in her words, it affected good order and discipline. Samantha slipped me her number one day, and Trish did not notice. As time went on, I worked late, less, and hung out with Samantha more. The problem with Trish is that I felt like she was looking down on me and wanted to have this power authority over me. Samantha wasn't like that at all. News flash to the women out there. Guys don't actually like bossy women. Maybe in short bursts, but not all the time. Sam and I were having dinner in the city one night. We had elected to have a table outside by the sidewalk, but that was a big mistake. Trish spotted us and stopped at our table. Oh, look what we have here, Trish said. I knew I was busted, but I felt bad for getting Sam into the situation. Trish had said no fraternization, but Sam came back immediately with, that's not in the company policy, and you know it. Trish looked visibly upset, and her eyes watered. She walked away, and that was it. I looked at Sam, and she told me that Trish can't just make up rules. The power was just going to her head, and Sam wasn't going to put up with that. That's when I started to fall in love with Sam. I know what you're thinking. I'm such a terrible person. I didn't want to lose my job or cause friction, so I went along with Trish. But now that there was another option, I was losing interest in a boss that wanted to use me for her pleasure. I got home that night and got ready for bed. There was a knock at the door. I answered the door and took a knife immediately to the chest. The person that stabbed me wore all black and a black mask. After stabbing me, they ran away just as quickly as they showed up. I got stabbed, but I was okay enough to call an ambulance. I was taken to the hospital. 
At the hospital, the police showed up and questioned me. I told them what happened. They said there was nothing they could do because there was no evidence at all. They just told me to be careful and not answer the door. They weren't able to do much about it. They told me there was an uptick in violent crimes in that area. But the DA wasn't prosecuting people like they did in the past, so I would just have to protect myself. Naturally, I was late to work the next day since I was at the hospital, and Trish refused to let me have the day off. When I showed up late, Trish had called me into her office. She told me I had to make up for being late. I had to work late, and scolded me for not wanting to work late recently like I had in the past. I told her I didn't want to work late anymore with her, and she snapped. He started screaming at me. The whole office had heard it through the paper-thin walls. When Trish threw a chair through the glass, Sam called 911. The cops came and tried to calm Trish down. They were eventually able to get her calm, but they did not know it was but they didn't know what was really going on. Management got involved and sent Trish home and questioned all of us. When they got to me, they asked me some very specific questions about working late. I got scared and confessed everything. They admitted that they already knew what was going on. After Trish had gone crazy and were disgusted that two of their employees were doing this. In addition, they noticed something else. The night of my stabbing, they saw Trish masking up in an all-black outfit right before she paid me a visit. They also caught her returning to her office with a bloody knife. The police checked her office and found the knife with some blood on it. They tested the blood with mine and there was a match. Trish was caught and the police picked her up at her house. She confessed to everything. I know I wasn't innocent in this story, but I didn't try to kill anyone either. But after that, I steered clear of boss babes. They let the power go to their head and they're just as bad as their male counterparts. I like the idea of a trad wife, a traditional wife that cooks and cleans, that takes care of you. But I think I messed up somehow. I was dating a girl named Yuki. She was from Japan and had been living in the States since college where we met as friends. Now that college was over, we both elected to stay in our college city for work. We had met again recently and hit it off. I had thought in college that she was the most gorgeous woman I had ever met, but I figured she was out of my league. I guess now that I was making a lot of money, I would be under consideration now. We had been dating a while and it was perfect. She was always there for me, and I loved the attention from her. I decided that I wanted her to move in with me. However, that's where things took a turn for the worse. She would cook and clean. I would try to do the dishes or vacuum and she wouldn't allow me. I thought it wasn't fair to her because we were both working, but for some reason she didn't want to hear it. It was great at first, but soon it became a problem. She would not hang out with me, but would continuously work. She would have dinner ready for me when I got home and would call me as soon as it was four. She knew when I got off and would call me right on time every single time. She would open the door for me when I pulled in the driveway as well. When we were done eating dinner, she would do the dishes and clean the kitchen. She would rub my feet and listen to how my day was. I asked about hers, but she kept it short. I wanted to know more about her, but all she wanted to do was talk about me more. She would then make me a bath and invite me in. She would wash my body and then take care of my needs. We would then go to the freshly made bed and she would take care of my needs once again. I don't know what I did to get so lucky, but I've hit the jackpot. The routine was happening for a while and life was good. I just wish there was more I could have done for her, but she refused every advance I ever made to do things for her. There wasn't a problem, until there was. I got a call from an old friend of mine one day. He was in town and wanted to have some drinks. When I told Yuki my friend was in town, 
She sounded disappointed that we couldn't do our usual routine, which I loved. I told her I couldn't just blow my friend off, and I invited her to come with us. She declined, though. I hung out with my friend for a while and got back home around 10. Yuki was in bed already. When I got home, Yuki wasn't around. I checked the bedroom, and she was already in bed. I reached over to give her a hug and a kiss, but she wouldn't look at me. Was it really such a big deal that I went out with my friend? She was so good to me, but am I supposed to just tell my friend I can't see him? Or am I just never supposed to go out? We had breakfast the next day, and things seemed fine. Over the next few weeks, though, I did notice her grip on my everyday life was getting tighter. She would complain when I got home late because of traffic. That's not something I can control. If I checked something on my phone and she was around, she would get visibly upset at me. If I went to the bathroom, as I had to, you know, go poop, she would knock on the door a few times to see if I was almost done. All the attention I was getting was nice at first, except for the bathroom, obviously. But this was getting bothersome. One day, my boss forced me to stay late. Yuki was not happy. She yelled at me in Japanese and hung up. She never yelled at me. I didn't really know what to do, so I just went back to work. One day, my boss forced me to stay late. I was still at work and I told Yuki. She was not happy. She yelled at me in Japanese on the phone and hung up. I really didn't know what to do, so I just went back to work. When I got home, there was food waiting for me at the table, but no Yuki. I sat down to eat. When I tasted the first bite, though, something was wrong with the food. It had a chemical taste. I spit it out and grew concerned. I went to find Yuki to tell her about the food. Maybe there was some kind of mistake. She was lying in the bed. I gently shook her, and there was no response. I shook her more aggressively a second time, and still no response. I turned her over and saw her eyes rolled in the back of her head. She was dead. There was a note beside the bed. She had confessed to having obsessive feelings about me that she couldn't control and decided to end it for both of us. She said she didn't want me with anyone else. The police came and confirmed what I had feared. The food at the table was poisoned. A healthy relationship requires give and take from both parties. If there's contributions only from one side, there could eventually be a bigger problem. It all started when I first met her. Jessica was a shy, timid girl who kept to herself, always sitting alone in the back of the classroom. I didn't pay much attention to her at first, but as time went on, I couldn't help but notice her more and more. She was very beautiful though, and I found myself glancing at her from the side of my eyes. I apologized for sounding like a creep, but I just couldn't help it. There was something about her that drew me in something mysterious and alluring. I was finding her so attractive, and soon I found myself wanting to be with her. I finally got enough courage to ask her out. She seemed very excited, and so was I. We went out a few times, and it was incredible. She was all about me, and I loved it. I could see us having a great future together. Things were good, for a while. It wasn't until later that I discovered the truth. She was a girl obsessed with me to the point of insanity. She would do anything to be with me, to keep me close, to make me hers and hers alone. And when I say anything, I mean anything. At first, her actions were harmless enough. Jessica would leave little notes in my locker, send me text messages throughout the day, and always find a way to be near me at all times. I thought it was a sweet gesture a sign that she was all about me. But as time went on, her behavior became more and more disturbing. I started to notice that she would follow me home from school, hiding in the bushes and watching me from a distance. She would watch me through my bedroom window when I was doing my homework. 
When I would catch her, she would knock on my window like she just got there. However, after the first coincidence, I started watching out as I was starting to think she was watching me. I saw her do it many times, and I started to just ignore her to see how long she would be out there. One of the times, she was out there for four hours, just watching me. She would also text me at all hours of the night, even when I asked her to stop. I had to eventually turn my phone to Do Not Disturb to avoid her texts. When I would wake up and turn off Do Not Disturb, I would see hundreds of text messages asking me, Why don't you love me? Why aren't you answering me? Do you think I'm ugly? Things like that. For a pretty girl, she had the worst self-esteem on the planet. I tried to be gentle with her, to let her down easy, but she was relentless. One day, she cornered me in the school hallway, her eyes wild and desperate. She begged me to be with her, to love her like she loved me. I tried to tell her that I couldn't, that I didn't feel the same way, but she wouldn't listen. I told her the truth. I couldn't take it anymore. The text messages, the stalking, and staring at me through my window. I knew everything, and I didn't want to be with her anymore. No matter how beautiful she was, I was starting to be concerned for my safety. And that's when things took a turn for the worse. She started to become vindictive, lashing out at anyone who she perceived as a threat to our relationship. She would tell lies about my friends to get them in trouble, and would sabotage any new romantic relationships that I started after her. All the girls were starting to turn me down because they knew Jessica was crazy. She tried to force herself on me, but I resisted. I managed to fight her off and call the police, but by the time they arrived, it was too late. She had taken her own life, leaving behind a note that said that she couldn't live knowing I was with somebody else. And that's when I realized the true horror of what I had been dealing with. She was a girl obsessed with me to the point of madness, and she in fact did go completely mad. And now she was gone leaving me with the guilt of what had just happened. I never spoke of her again. I never told anyone what happened. But every now and then, I catch a glimpse of her in my dreams, her eyes full of love and madness. I wonder if I'll ever be able to escape her, to live a normal life, without the constant memory of what she had done. There was a girl named Brandy who was always known for her extreme love for her boyfriend, Josh. Josh was a popular guy in their school, and everyone adored him. Brandy was always by his side, and no one ever saw Josh without Brandy. They had been dating for three years, and Brandy's love for Josh only grew stronger every day. But Josh had a secret. He was getting tired of Brandy's obsessive love for him. He wanted to break up with her, but he was scared of her reaction. He knew that Brandy was not an ordinary girl, and he didn't want to hurt her or anyone else. He decided to keep their relationship going until he could find a way to break up with her safely. One day, Josh got a text message from an anonymous number. The message read, If you want to get rid of Brandy, meet me tonight at the park. Josh was shocked and scared. He didn't know who sent the message or what their intention was. He was confused but also relieved. He saw this as an opportunity to get out of his relationship with Brandy without hurting her. That night, Josh went to the abandoned building in the park alone. He didn't tell anyone where he was going. When he arrived at the abandoned building by the park, he saw a girl standing in the dark. The girl was wearing a black hoodie, and her face was hidden. She spoke in a low, whispery voice. Are you Josh? she asked. Josh nodded his head. I know what you want, the girl said. I can help you. How? Josh asked, confused. I can make Brandy disappear, the girl replied. Josh was horrified. He didn't want Brandy to get hurt or worse. He quickly turned to leave, but the girl grabbed his arm. Don't worry, the girl said. I won't hurt her. I'll just make her go away. How? Josh asked. Leave it to me the girl said. Just give me some time. Josh left the building, feeling scared and uneasy. He didn't know who the girl was, and he didn't know what she was capable of. 
He tried to forget the incident and continue his relationship with Brandy, but things just got worse. Brandy's obsession with Josh grew stronger every day. She started becoming more overbearing, following him wherever he went. She even started threatening other girls who talked to him or looked at him with violence. Brandy even got in a fight with a girl for just looking at Josh and mouthing off to her. She beat that girl within an inch of her life. When Josh finally got her to stop fighting, that girl ended up in the ICU, but somehow Brandy did not get in trouble for it. Her dad was friends with the local sheriff and got her out of it with a warning. Josh was scared for his life and the lives of others. He knew that Brandy was not normal, and he didn't know what to do. One day, Josh got a call from the police. They told him that Brandy had gone missing. They found her phone and some of her belongings at an abandoned building near the park. The police suspected foul play and wanted to question Josh. Josh was horrified. He didn't know what to say or do. But he was scared that the hooded girl might have something to do with it. He decided to go to the police and tell them everything. When he arrived at the police station, he was shocked to see the anonymous hooded girl sitting outside of the station. What's going on? Josh asked. The girl turned to him and smiled. Don't worry, Josh. Brandy is gone, and you had nothing to do with it. Just tell them the truth and we can be together finally. I will be good to you, and won't treat you like that whore Brandy did. But she had an N95 mask on, and I really couldn't see. The hood was making her eyes impossible to identify as well. Josh was shocked. With this new and disturbing information, Josh went into the interrogation room and told the detectives everything. He even told them that the girl was outside the station right now. The officers ran out of the room and looked to find the girl, but she was already gone. They reviewed the security footage and saw the girl Josh was talking about, but they could not identify her. The detectives had determined that Josh was not at fault for Brandy's disappearance and let him go. A few months passed by, and Josh was now with a girl named Jennifer. It was so great that Josh was able to find love once again. Jennifer was kind, sweet, and gentle. All the things that Brandy wasn't. She was so good to him, and he was so happy to be in a good relationship finally. However, he started to notice that she would get really upset if he didn't answer her text immediately. He just thought... She really likes me, and I guess she'll always be loyal. There was a girl named Destiny who had always been a bit obsessive about her crushes. She would follow them around, taking pictures and videos of them without their knowledge, and write down their names on every available surface she could find. Like Destiny and Guy's name, together forever, stuff like that. She had amassed thousands of pictures and videos of different guys. She would stalk them until she found a better looking guy that she desired to be with more than the previous one. But it wasn't until she met her latest crush, a guy named Grayson, that would finally result in her going all the way with her obsessions. She wanted to actually be with this one. Destiny was convinced that Grayson was her soulmate, the only person in the world who would ever truly understand her. However, she started out way too strong for anyone, but especially Grayson. She would leave notes for him in places he would usually go, professing her undying love and begging him to notice her. He thought this was some kind of joke. No one is this nuts. This must have been his friends playing a joke on him. Once, he accidentally met Destiny and realized that it wasn't a joke, and he was terrified. Grayson was not interested in her at all, and in fact found her behavior more than a little unsettling. But Destiny refused to give up. She started stalking Grayson everywhere he went, watching him from a distance and taking notes on his daily schedule from morning to night. She even broke into his house one night, just to see what it would feel like to be close to him. And that's when she found something that made her blood run cold. In Grayson's bedroom, Destiny found a collection of photos and notes that he had been keeping about her. There were naked photos of her in the shower and in her bedroom. She did like to be naked whenever possible. 
but was surprised that Grayson was able to get such great pictures of her without her knowledge. If she would have known, she would just let him come in and take all the pictures he wanted. She loved him that much. He had been following her too, watching her every move and taking videos of her without her knowledge. Randy was shocked and horrified, but also a little bit excited. Maybe Grayson did love her after all, in his own twisted way. This made her undying love for him that much more. From that moment on, Destiny's obsession with Grayson spiraled out of control. She would break into his house regularly. She started trying on his clothes and cologne, and even went as far as to dye her hair to match his color. And all the while, Grayson remained distant and would not just admit that he was obsessed with her too. This was irritating her. She was getting really mad, and he was being such a selfish prick and wouldn't just love her. She was too nervous to confront him though, and just let her feelings tear her apart. One day, Destiny decided enough was enough. She was tired of waiting for Grayson to notice her. She was tired of waiting for Grayson to admit his true feelings, so she decided to take matters into her own hands. She broke into his house again, this time armed with a knife, and waited for him to come home. When he finally did, she pounced on him, intent on making him love her no matter what. Grayson fought back, but Destiny was too strong and too desperate to be deterred. She stabbed him repeatedly, each thrust of her knife fueling her delusional belief that they were meant to be together. And when she was finally done, she sat down next to his lifeless body and smiled. Destiny was finally happy, because she knew that Grayson would never be able to leave her. They would be together forever, just as she always wanted. And even though the police eventually caught up to her and locked her away for the rest of her life, Destiny didn't care. She had achieved her ultimate goal, and that's all that mattered 